you want to grab in your bulletin, there's a beige sheet that you can pull out. <clears throat> on one side is um, some fill in the blanks, on the other side is an open spot where you can take a notes throughout the service as well. And we're moving into the fourth week in the Gospel of John. The scriptures will show up on the screen, but if you want to find the Gospel of John, you can find it right near the end of the Pew Bible or your own Bible that you have with you. Um, you'll find Revelation, Jude, and then the three letters of John. I said Gospel of John, didn't I? It's the letters of John, of First John, is where we want to turn to in a few moments. If you go back to the very first slide, um, we're in a series that is finding what's real, called finding what's real in a world of fake, exploring how John, the youngest apostle of Jesus, uh, grew and impacted the lives of Christians in the early church. And in these letters, he is writing to a group of Christians and helping them to see the world from a different light, to understand that there is more to this world around them about who they are, about who Jesus is, and about what is going on in the world in relationship to their faith in Jesus Christ. I like this series title because it helps us to see that um, and helps bring a, an emphasis to the idea that we live in a world where there are things that aren't the way God intended them to be, that aren't really reality, and that there is a lot of fake things that um, the schemes of the devil tries to trick us into believing. So my first question for us today is, who are you? Who are you? Really, who are you? When we begin to think about this, the struggle of identity is something that we struggle with from the time that we are born up into our adult years, isn't it? Are we defined by the family that we come from, or maybe our, where, the country where our ancestors came from? Maybe defined by our work. If you ask someone who they are, often what will happen is they'll tell you their name and they'll tell you a little bit in that first conversation about what they do. Because that's one of the ways that we identify ourselves by who we are. I don't know if you remember a number of years ago um, in one of the, the Christmas series that I did, we talked about um, some of the things that happened within North America. It was uh, talking about the consumerism of the world that we live in. And a comment was made that when people ask those outside of North America who North Americans are, the most common answer to that definition is North Americans are shoppers. We like to shop, unlike they do in most of the rest of the world. And unfortunately, I think that's probably a pretty accurate picture <clears throat> of much of who we are in North America. But there is something different in a different way that God views us. I want to read to you a story. <clears throat> It helps us to see this from a different light, kind of an illustration. There was a man who was walking through a forest one day, and he found a young eagle who had fallen out of his nest. He took it home and put it in a barn in his barnyard, where it soon, soon learned to eat and behave like the chickens. One day, a naturalist passed by the farm and asked why it was that the king of all birds should be confined to live in, a, in the barnyard with the chickens. And the farmer replied that since he had given it um, chicken feed and trained it to be a chicken, it had never learned to fly. And since it behaved like chickens now, it was no longer an eagle. The naturalist asked, he said, but it still has the heart of an eagle, and it can surely be taught to fly. So he picked up this eagle that was acting like a chicken and lifted it towards the sky and said, You belong to the sky and not to the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, looked scared and confused. He did not know who this man was or what he was doing. And seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down and went off with them again. The naturalist tried again. He took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You are an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. 
But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and the world and jumped down once more for chicken food. And finally he took him out to a high mountain. And there he held this king of birds high above him and encouraged him again, saying, You are an eagle, you belong to the sky, stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle looked around, looked back towards the barnyard down the mountain and up towards the sky. Then the naturalist lifted him straight towards the sun, and it happened at that moment that the eagle began to tremble. And slowly he stretched his wings and with a triumphant cry soared away into the heavens. Now it may be that this eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It even may be that he occasionally revisits the barnyard. But as far as anyone knows, he has never returned to the life of a chicken. It's an old illustration from the 70s out of a theology book, a magazine that was published. But it illustrates for us a picture of how we identify ourselves sometimes. That we can be like that eagle stuck in the barnyard, not realizing the true story of who we are and what we're capable of. So just like that large eagle wandered around that small farmyard, he had so much more potential than he had ever seen or had experienced until someone pointed him in the right direction. And I would say that it's the same with us. In the verses that we ended off with last week were first John verses two or chapter two, verse twenty eight and twenty nine. I want to read them for you along with um, a little bit of the next verse of chapter three. It says this it says, And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears he may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So that first section from verse 28, John is talking to us as his children, and it says, if you continue in him, if you continue in Christ, you can stand, when, you appear, when he appears, confident and unashamed at Jesus' second coming. You can be confident and unashamed. He goes on, he says, see what, is, see what the great love the Father has lavished on us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We are God's children, born of Him. Everyone who does what is right, it says, has been born of Him. What great love the Father has given us that he has called us children of God. There are many ways that we look a little different than some of the people around us. And I'm sure it would have been odd to watch that eagle walking around the farmyard picking up the grains along with the chickens as it ate. But when it began to soar and fly and realized its true potential, you can imagine the look of those chickens as they watched it fly around. Watch that eagle fly around. And the same can be true with us. When we realize our true potential, the world around us looks at us and, like the scripture says, may not even know who we are anymore because they don't know the truth of what comes behind us, of who is behind us and with us. What we have realized that has made us different is that God loves us. The first fill in your blank, I want you to write it down in the personal though, God loves me. God loves me. The first part of verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Lavished is such 
an important word. It's a one-way word. It's something that is given without any expectation of return. But it is given to each of us, and not just given to us. The word that is used expresses in English this idea of it being lavished, poured out on us. So I want you to think about this for a little bit. As God looked at his creation, as he looked at you and at me, you need to realize that he didn't need to lavish his love out upon us. There was no requirement given as God created the world that he needed to pour out, that he needed to lavish his love for us upon us. I want you to hear me. We know that God created a plan of salvation for us. That he created a way that we could be saved from hell and for all eternity, spend time with him. But he could have easily done that in a way that saved us without lavishing his love upon us. He showed how much we mean to him by going way further and way beyond what would be required to save his people. And the illustration, the the phrase that is used because it has such rich theological and, and real ideas to it is that he lavished his love on us so that we could be called children of God. He could have saved us without us becoming his children. This is all extra because of his great love for us so that you and I could be born into his family and be called children of God. So when we read phrases like this, and John uses it in this letter quite a bit, and it's used in other places in the Bible as well, I want you to remember that this was completely unnecessary. But it was so important to God that he loves us so much that he did it anyway. Because he not only wanted to save you, he wanted to be in a relationship with you as father and child. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. I need to pause there and just let you think about that for a moment because I think it is an amazing an amazing statement of how much God loves you. John continues on, though, and he says, not only will we be called children of God, we will be like him. That's the next fill in the blank. We will be like him. We will be like Jesus. If you go to the next slide, verses 2 and 3 will show up. So right after, he says, we will be called children of God John continues to write, and he says, Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but what we know is that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We will be like him. We can be assured of our position, of our true nature, because we have become children of God. And because of that, it begins to change who we are. It begins to change our inner nature as we have been adopted into this heavenly family. We shall be like him. 
for we shall see him as he is. In the first part of um, these two verses here, it says, uh, What will be has not yet been made known, but our present standing is clear, both of the Father and of the world that we live in. What John is saying here is that there is so much ahead for us in this eternity with God, and that part isn't clear. We get glimpses of it. We get small snippets throughout Scripture of what this eternity will be like. We get ideas, we have theories, we have some um, educated guesses, we shall say. But know that it is still truly a mystery as to what it will be like. Have you ever taken a picture of something because you wanted to capture that moment and and then when you go back and look at that picture, you realize that it really doesn't do it justice. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were driving a, out of town along the highway, and the northern lights were amazing. They were all up north of us in the sky, just off the highway, dancing in brilliant greens and purples as they danced along the northern sky. And we tried to take a picture of it because it really was a phenomenal night for the Northern Lights. How many of you have seen the Northern Lights? I was going to ask June. She didn't put her hand up. I think everyone else has. She'll get her chance. But I can give you a picture of what it looked like for us. If you just close your eyes with me. And what you can see right now with your eyes closed is exactly what we saw on the camera. It was all black. <laughs> Nothing showed up on the camera from these amazing northern lights. Even if we would have got them, we know that it wouldn't have done justice to what they actually looked like, right? And I think it's the same thing when we think about heaven. When we think about what it'll be like after Jesus returns, we can get snippets, we can get pictures from people like uh, John, who in Revelation saw some of the end times, like some of the prophets of old, who give these glimpses of what it will be like to be with God. But they are just small snippets. But what we can be assured of is that that part has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like Jesus. We shall become more and more like him. And in place of a glory that we cannot even begin to fathom, a glory that we will never understand until we experience it for ourselves, we have the opportunity to become like the one who helped create it all. We will be like him. I want to emphasize a few of the things that we have just read in this verse. And that's the next fill in the blank. So if we think about who Jesus is, he is God's son. This one who we are to become like is God's Son. And so when I ask the question again, who are you? You also are God's son or daughter. It's the next fill in the blank. Who are you? You are God's son or daughter. See, John here is writing to the church, and if you are, as he defines it in this letter over and over again, a child of God, which if we look back from the first couple chapters, someone who walks in the light, who conf has confessed their sin, who dwells with Jesus, who loves your bro our brothers and sisters, and is anointed by God, is given strength through the Holy Spirit to withstand the schemes of the devil, 
the lies around us that we read about last week in chapter 2. You are, too, a member of God's family, a son or daughter of God. You are a child of God, and Jesus is your brother. As you think about that, we let it sink in on a personal level that we can be, that we are a child of God. That also means that the person sitting next to you is also a child of God. It means that your spouse is, can be a child of God. One of the marriage speakers that I, I like to use when working with couples, he likes to use this phrase. He says, you need to remember that the person you're married to, their father is the creator of the universe. So how you treat them impacts the father who loves them. And it's very, very true. We are God's son or daughters. So I want to read through a few verses again, verses 2 and 3, which we just read, but thinking about a specific question for us. So it says, we shall be like him. And in these questions, I want you to think about how we can be sure of our place, of our adoption into his family. It says, Dear friends, now that we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. When he appears, we shall be like him, for when we, we shall see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. All who have this hope in him purify themselves. As I was reading this in preparation with the, the study group and on my own uh, personal time, a question arose. Do I need to be as good as Jesus? says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this open him purify themselves just as he is pure. So do I need to be as good as Jesus? It's an honest question from these verses. And the ones that follow that we'll look at, um, John emphasizes this even more. But the answer is no. John talked about it in the earlier chapters, in verses like chapter 1, verse 9, where he said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But the sobering reality for us is that God will give us whatever we want. If you want more of God, he made it possible through Jesus Christ to become more like him. And if you don't want more of God, then that's also what you get. And ultimately, the choice is between following God and not. And the end of reality is what hell was created for. But if you want more of God, you don't only get Him, you don't only get salvation from the things that have gone wrong, the sins that you have committed, you get adopted into His family, and it will change you. At least according to John, that should change you. 
Because we get the chance to become like our brother Jesus, purifying ourselves and becoming more of who God created us to be and less of who this world, this broken world, is trying to trick us into being. theological term for it would be sanctification, of growing in our holiness, of becoming more like Jesus. That all who have this hope in him purify themselves. They grow in their Christ-likeness. So do I need to be as good as Jesus? No. But we should be becoming more and more like him each and every day. If we look at the earlier chapters and if we read the whole letter together, you would see these pieces all wrapped together. That as you walk in the light, which it talks about in chapter 1, as you grow from a child being a young child to a young man to a mature father, it's speaking of our growth and our change as we follow Jesus as we guard our hearts against the Antichrist, which we talked about last week. And now John goes even deeper to how we guard and grow and change right from our souls on up as we purify ourselves and become just like he is. We need to realize that this is a maturing journey. And what we want and what we choose does have an impact on what we become and who we are. As we read further, I want to define sin for you, and John actually does it. He says, sin is lawlessness. John defines it at its most basic root. It is a disregard of for both the law of God and inherently because of that a disregard for the lawmaker himself. If we read the next couple of verses in 1 John 3 verses 4 to 6, this is what we read. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, and no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. At its basic root, sin is lawlessness. And we need to call sins, our sins, what they are. They're not just mistakes. They're not just things that we trip over or stumble over. In fact, it is doing something against the will of God, against the law of God, against the person of God. And just like within the 12-step program, the first step is to accept the truth, the reality of what is going on. We need to accept what sin is. It is a lawlessness against the laws of God and ultimately the one who created it and us. But we also need to recognize that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. He appeared so that he might take away our sins and give us forgiveness. That's what we find right in these verses. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. So that we can be saved from ourselves. And when that happens, no one who lives in him, in Jesus, no one who is adopted into that family, will keep on sinning, it says. In fact, he says, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. 
So I don't know about you, but when I read that, it paused me for a moment. So I have accepted what Jesus has done for me. I recognize that he came and he appeared. He came to earth in order to take away my sins. So am I sinless is the question. Because as you read this on the surface, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. I would ask for a show of hands how many of you have sinned. Probably all of us. Or it would be all of us. How many this morning? But that's not the way that John makes his statement. He doesn't say that we're not sinless. He says, he that doesn't keep on sinning. That no one continues who continues to sin. There's a difference between those two. One is completed, finished work, and one is ongoing. We're going to read through down to verse 10 because John gives more detail into this. So we're going to read these verses again in 3, 4, and 6 and then just follow through to 10. So it says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, and no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. John makes that statement further and further about who we are and what happens when we sin or don't sin, continue on sinning. What is John talking about here? It says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. That's verse 9. No one who is born of God. So who is born of God? Well, you and me, if we are the children of God. No one will continue to sin if they are born of God. How does that work? Because just like you, I've raised my hand. There's sin in my life. We live in a broken and fallen world. So what does this mean and what can we learn from what John is talking about here? We need to remember, and I say it again, that this is one verse within a whole passage where John has already spent an extended amount of time helping us to be assured of our place with God, our position in the family, that we can be children of God if we do these things. So we need to be assured of both our position with him, of our purity before him because of what Jesus did, But we also need to know that when we meet Jesus, it changes us. As he writes here, a seed remains in them. 
in one of the series I did um, a few months ago on what on the What on Earth Am I Here For series. I talked about that in detail throughout a whole sermon, what it means to have God's seed in us, remain in us. And it's essentially this idea of growing in our Christ-likeness, that God planted something within us that can grow and mature, that should grow and mature. See, we all sin. John has been clear about that. But this nature within us doesn't sit right with the sin that we still hold in our life. They are in conflict with one another. Just like in chapter 1 when he talked about how light and dark cannot coexist in the same place. How darkness cannot exist when light comes into the room. We know that that light will chase the darkness out of every corner. It's the same in our lives when God comes in and his seed remains in us. And we grow in that. As that grows, it chases out the darkness. Ultimately, Jesus has paid for it all. And we stand before God pure and clean and forgiven. But we do have a choice. And when God begins to change us, when that seed begins to grow through the Holy Spirit in our lives, through the things that you do as you study the Scripture and in prayer, and as we gather here each week and learn more and fellowship more and worship more, that seed continues to grow and chase out more and more darkness. But you have a choice to either let that darkness go or to hold on to it. And here John is talking about the, the habitual sins, the ways where we have the option to choose and we choose to willfully disobey something that we know God is telling us not to do. You know what's wrong. You may have slipped in these areas in the past, but now you're to the point where you say, it doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal. It's not hurting anyone. I don't need to worry about it because God's already forgiven me. And you make the choice, or I make the choice, to willingly and willfully keep on engaging with that darkness, whatever that sin is. And that's what John is talking about here. Not that we are all perfect and that we attain that perfection right now, but that when we choose to keep on sinning in ways that we know we shouldn't, I'm not, he's not talking about the stumbling and the mistakes that we make because we we all do it. But we each have the choice when God puts his finger on something in our lives And I know that he's done it to me, and I know that he's done it to you. And we say, no, I'm not ready to give that up. I'm going to keep on doing it because it doesn't really matter. That's what he's talking about. Choosing to sin over and over again. And letting not the light reign, but the darkness reign within ourselves. See, Jesus appeared, John says, to destroy the devil's work. Jesus appeared to destroy the darkness, not just from within the world, but from within our hearts and in our souls. That's what John tells us. Jesus appeared to destroy the devil's work. He came to make it the way it should be, to make you and me the way that God originally created us to be, so that we could be more and more like him each and every day. I 
as I thought about these verses and what we should take home, the things that we could reflect on. There's a whole lot more in the home study questions and other references that help you to understand what this means deeper. But these three things, I think, we need to reflect on, that we need to dwell on. The first is, are you a child of God? I want you to take time to dwell on this. If you're not, why not? What's stopping you? Consider why you're waiting. If you are a child of God, if you have accepted the forgiveness of Jesus and begun to walk in that light and let that seed start to grow or maybe grow over many years within you, my question is, are you a child of God in the way you behave? Have you been changed by the fact that the creator of the universe wants you in his family? That he accepts you where you are, but even with that acceptance, it should drive us to become more like who he created us to be. And he helps us do that because he knows that the world around us has corrupted us. Just like the chickens corrupted the eagle. Made him think he was someone he wasn't. The world does the same to us. And when we become part of God's family, he comes alongside. The Spirit dwells within and begins to say, you know, you were made for so much more. And he will help us figure out who that is to fix the corruption of the world over time, one day at a time. So are you a child of God? And if you are, do you act like it? The second question I have for us is, are there habitual sins in your life? What is God working at in your life? It's not that everything is revealed the moment that we become followers of Jesus and he gives us the laundry list of everything that we need to change. But over time, as we grow, as we learn, as we experience, as we begin to change, like layers of an onion, it gets peeled off one at a time. And new things are revealed in our life. But sometimes there are those habitual things, the regular reoccurring things that we willingly choose that we don't know how to give up. So are there habitual sins in your life? And if there are, I want you to know that we can help. God brought us together as a family, as brothers and sisters, because... We need each other. We can help with you. We can pray with you. We can seek help if needed. We can come alongside you. As John talked about the young, the children, the young men, and the fathers, that's the idea of a family coming together to help one another grow in that journey, to mature. If there are, you're not alone, and we can help each other walk through them, if you're willing. And finally, it is, number three, to love one another. I encourage you to read through the rest of chapter three as you head home today, because He goes just further and emphasizes what this looks like. And he talks about how, as children of God, we need to love one another, our brothers and sisters. That being part of God's family should change us. Our sins, 
but also how we view other people and how we should love other people. In there, he also gives a reference to the greatest commandment that we should love not only God, but one another. Are we loving one another well? Are you? In the middle of, of that chapter, in verse 16, 1 John three sixteen, we find this verse which leads us into communion for today. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Remembering both what Jesus did for us and how much we should love one another. Christ laid down his life for us because of his great love for you and me. As we take communion today, I want you to reflect upon these things. As we pass the bread out, we know that it represents the broken body of Jesus, a body that was given as a sacrifice for you and me, that was hung on a cross out of his great love for us. We'll also take the cup, and we know that it represents the blood of the new covenant, a sacrifice that ended all sacrifices and created, as Scripture talks about, a new way to be in a relationship with God so that we could be adopted into his family. I invite the worship team to come up, and they're going to lead us as we as we pass out the bread and the cup today. As the bread comes out to you, I'll invite the ushers to come up to you. As the bread um, comes out, it's a, actually a gluten-free cracker, but it's not so much what it is. It's as you hold it, I want you to remember what it represents. That that cracker represents the body of Jesus, the body that was broken for you and me. We're going to pass it out. I'm going to pray for it just before we do. And then when you feel ready, you can eat that cracker. As we are passing it out, there'll be a song, a couple of verses that you can sing along with, or you can sit in, in reflection of the words or of what that cracker that you're holding means. And then we'll take a pause and pray for the cup and pass it out as well. Let me pray for this bread. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us so much that you that you gave us your Son. And this morning, as we take this bread, we do recognize the solemnness of what it represents, a body that was given, given to the point of death, that was broken and bruised and beaten. And so as we take this, we recognize that this is done out of your great love for us. So, God, we do this, remembering what you did one last and final time so that we could be restored in a relationship with you. We thank you for this. And we thank you that we can remember it in this way, along with our brothers and sisters around the globe and right here this morning.